mighty man of God, one of the most mighty people that we have ever seen in history. But he didn't do it alone. And uh, he had some good men that served with him through his ups and downs. And a lot of times we, we look at this from 10,000 feet and we just see all the great accomplishments that Paul has done and we've never really tracked with his heart. Well, well, sometimes we don't track with his heart. The times when he struggled, the times when he was hurting, the times when he says in the scriptures, he said, we despaired of even life itself. He had the promises of God, but emotionally in a place of, of despair. The times when he said, I lost sleep over the church, saying, I wept for the church. He had anguish. He said, it was pleading uh, with people to be saved. Uh, great depth of feeling. Sometimes everything going his way, sometimes struggles. Uh, recently, I've been thinking about different guys in the Bible and the struggles that they had. Because you hear the name Moses, you think, all oh, the miracles in Egypt and the, the mighty way he led out all those people. And he led them out. They saw incredible, miraculous power like no other time in human history, before or after. And then right away they say, what did you bring us out here for? Were there not enough graves in Egypt? Do you think he ever wanted to shake them or give them one of these? <laughs> Were there not enough graves in Egypt? What, what kind of response is that to what God was doing in their midst? Uh, how, how the people he led challenged his authority, sometimes even wanted to kill him. His own brother and sister sometimes trying to take his position, but at the same time, he had his brother and sister, and he also had Caleb, and he had Joshua. He wasn't in this alone. Daniel, you ever think about Daniel, the great prophet who was abducted out of his land at a young age? You know, young men have hopes and dreams. He probably had favorite streets he liked to walk on. Maybe he liked to go outside of the city, and there was a favorite hillside. There were things that made his spirit soar. He was taken away from his home. He would never see Jerusalem again. Terrible. He was probably made a eunuch. He's probably castrated to be in the king's palace. He would never see his friends back in Jerusalem. It would not be rare or unlikely for him to have had his eye on a young lady. And now that dream is gone. He will never have children. His dreams to have a family of his own gone forever. But Daniel, in a foreign land, forced to learn a foreign language, foreign culture. He did have three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He wasn't alone there. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Now, if you're going to be a prophet, you don't want people to call you the weeping prophet. Uh, that means you had a rough go of it. We just started our study of Jeremiah on Thursday night. If you don't have a small group in our church, a neighborhood. Thursday night, we just started the book of Jeremiah. I encourage you to be there. We saw that Jeremiah, most, life, most times when you start a ministry, maybe it'll start small, and it's just going to go, and you want your life to be better at the end than it was at the beginning. Jeremiah was working with the good king Josiah. Everything was working for him. Josiah foolishly tries to oppose the, uh, the, the pharaoh of Egypt. He gets struck down. And every king after that, in one kind of works with him, but every king after that opposes him, and his life is miserable. That's not the direction, that's not the trajectory you'd like to live your life. Uh, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, was ridiculed and hated by the people that he was trying to help. People God had sent him to preach to. And, and he too was abducted, just like Daniel was abducted to Babylon. He was telling the people, don't go to Egypt, don't go to Egypt. <clears throat> now, it's bad enough if they say, heck with you, prophet of God, we're going to Egypt. Instead, they abduct him and take him to Egypt. That is not right. That is just not fair. So, so he didn't want to go to Egypt. He was telling the people, don't go to Egypt. You can't trust the Egyptians. And they abducted him. They took him down to Egypt, the very place he had told them not to go. How frustrating. And then it's not in the Bible, but Jewish tradition tells us that after they kidnapped him and forced him to go to Egypt, they probably stoned him and killed him in Egypt. I don't know why they brought him. They didn't like what he said anyways. 
Jeremiah had a handful of friends, though, guys that are with him, even when he's being imprisoned, even when, when the government, the kings are opposed to him, uh, and foremost among them was this fellow named Baruch. Uh, Baruch was just always with them. Uh, he wrote down this, this great prophecy, and, the, and he gave it to the king. No doubt Baruch was his scribe. No doubt Jeremiah was thinking, this is going to change things, or God, speak to the nation. Maybe, maybe this is going to just be the thing that flips everything. The king said, let's read this. And they read a line, cut it, threw it. Well, I don't know if they had scissors, maybe a knife, I don't know. They cut it, threw it into the fire. He had put so much work into that. Read the next line, cut it, throw it into the fire. And so Baruch comes back to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah says, well, God says, do it again. <laughs> they had to write the same thing over again. But this is interesting. When you're thinking about how, how the Bible is uh, written down and how it's inspired, the Bible says, and they wrote it again using many similar words. So it didn't have to be the exact same words. Isn't that interesting? Uh, but anyways, Baruch was with them in the good times. In the Well, there wasn't many good times. Baruch was just with them. Let's leave it at that. Uh, we read these stories. We've heard about them. If you grew up in the church, you've heard these since Sunday school. We dig into them at church and at Bible study, but sometimes we're so busy trying to see what we can get out of it ourselves. Now, that's not a wrong way to read Scripture. You don't want to read it as just history or, or some sort of social science. You want to see, God, how does this apply to my situation? <clears throat> but here's something that's ironic. When we're so busy looking into it, what we can get it out of it for ourselves, <clears throat> and we fail to stop and think what it was like for people who went through these things, the, the irony of it is, if we did take time and think about it from their perspective, from their lives, we'd get so much more out of it. <coughs> I had a three hours of sleep last night, so if I go to sleep, please wake me because I really want to give this message today. Here, maybe I'll stand up. <clears throat> We've been uh, studying Acts for some time now. Uh, the first part was, was a lot of it had to do with uh, Peter and the Jerusalem church. But then it shifted the spotlight over to a, this character named Paul. I want us to just think about him for a while. We're going to do some backtracking, look at some things that happened in his life. In 2 Corinthians 11, 23-28, Paul compares himself to other believers, other leaders in the church. Now, right away, you and I are saying, don't do that. Don't compare yourself to other people. That's, that's miserable. He does it, even though he says, I think I'm out of my mind to talk like this. But he does it because... This church that he started in Corinthians, he started it. He led many of them to Christ. They're now following the hip new pastors, the guys that are a little more flashy than him, and they're looking down at him. He says, what, i got to give you my credentials? i got to explain to you why you should listen to what I have to say? So here's what he says. He's comparing himself to these other believers. He said, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently. You notice he didn't say, I was in prison once for Jesus. He said, I was in prison more frequently than those guys are in prison. Been flogged more severely. How, how would you like that to be the thing you brag about? Now, flogging means they were ripping the flesh off of his back with these whips. He's flogged severely. And been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews, as his fellow countrymen, 40 lashes minus one. Five times. Uh, they were allowed to give, under Jew Jewish tradition, 40 lashes. The reason they'd make it minus one is because they didn't want to miscount. So they thought, if we miscounted, we don't want to give them 41. We, so they'd give 39, 40 lashes minus one. This beating, this lashing was so severe that sometimes people went insane. They never recovered from it. Paul got it five times at this point. Does it make you kind of wonder why he kept going back to the synagogues? Every time he went to a new city, he'd go right to the synagogue and, and, and first share the message of Jesus Christ with his fellow Jews. He was whipped so severely that it sometimes could kill a person or, or drive them insane. He, he endured this five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. So that's somehow different than the lashings and the floggings. He's keeping track, though. 
Once I was pelted with stones, he just moves on. Once I was pelted with stones, remember that? They hit him with rocks and came over to him and thought he was dead. That's why they stopped hitting him with stones. He's bleeding from his head, breathing from his, bleeding from his nose and his mouth, body covered in welts. He's dead. They left him. He got back up again. He went right back into the city. Uh, three times I was shipwrecked. Well, we know that this hasn't even hit yet. The fourth time when he's shipwrecked, coming up in the book of Acts. You know what? I'm not a big fan of airplanes and boats and stuff. I do them because you have to. They can be fun. But if I was shipwrecked once, I'd consider not getting on another boat. If I had to, you know, do it again. Three times I was shipwrecked. He says, I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I bet you he prayed, and I bet you he wondered if he's coming out of that one. He says, I've been constantly on the move. I like, I'm a homebody. I'm an introvert. I like being at home. I like reading. Uh, he was constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers. I remember when I was at school, a missions team went down to South America, and one of the young people from our college was killed in a swollen river. Uh, well, well, on missions trip. Uh, he said, I've been in danger from bandits. Luke doesn't even record some of this stuff. It is too much. <laughs> I've been in danger from my fellow Jews. Oh, that's bad. My fellow countrymen. In danger from Gentiles. So who, who doesn't hate him? In danger in the city. In danger in the country. In danger at sea. In danger from false believers. So people pretending to be Christians. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep, I have known hunger and thirst, and have often gone without food, I have been cold and naked, which is terrible. Besides everything else, besides all the physical stress, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. So he says, put all the physical stuff aside, I've got mental anguish for all these churches. Are they walking with Christ? Are they growing in their faith? Two weeks ago, the title of the sermon was, Paul Starts a Riot, What's New? Paul Starts a Riot, What's New? Par for the course. Paul could start a church and get run out of town in two weeks. It's really important that we uh, let the gospel offend, that we don't have offensive personalities, that it's not our attitude that it's turning off non-believers. Let the cross of Christ offend. Kneel before the cross. You can't cut it except the grace, except the work of Jesus Christ that he did for you. That, that is humbling because none of us can walk into heaven and say, look at me, look at the good things I've done. So let the cross offend. But sometimes, not sometimes, I really believe that we're guilty, not most of us. There's some people that are just plain offensive and they're, they're rude and in, in your face in ways that are inappropriate. But most Christians, guess what? We're guilty of not wanting to disturb anybody. And how many churches do we start? Did you know, this is terrible, the average Christian doesn't even lead one person to Christ in their life. Now, folks in this room, I'm, I'm sure many of you are thinking, I can count 10, 20 more. There are the average person doesn't even lead one person to Christ. That is terrible. We're so offended about bothering people. Of, of Maybe somebody will think I'm a little too religious. Maybe think people, somebody will think I'm a little too intense. Paul could start a church and get run out of town in two weeks. Well, it's two to three week, weeks, depending on the, um, when they counted the uh, Sabbath days. He was a force of nature. He won people to Christ, and yes, he did alienate quite a few people around him. There were Jews, there were Greeks, there were Romans who wanted to kill him. And even some fellow Christians who would travel around trying to correct what Paul was teaching, not understanding that he was speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit and that they were the wrong ones. Now, Paul was loving and kind he, he, his heart was evident to everybody. Everybody could see his heart. 
He lived and died to help other people become disciples of Jesus. He didn't get rich. He didn't get girls. He didn't get you know, anything out of this. He, lived his, he met the resurrected Jesus Christ. Jesus had died. He was going everywhere persecuting Christians. And then on the road, he's going to Damascus. And on the road appears Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus Christ. His life changes. And now the one who was making Christians suffer for their faith, he goes on and suffers for the name of Jesus Christ. He lived his life to help other people find Jesus. He died helping other people find Jesus. And to this end, he was blunt. He was confrontational. He could be sarcastic and rude. He, you know, he and Jeremiah have two things in common. Honestly, they say things that I would not say in private company and can't imagine that God saw fit to put these things in Scripture. And yet, here they are, right in Scripture, uh, Jeremiah in his earthy way, Paul in his sarcastic, rude way. Uh, he's always getting into trouble. He was a troublemaker everywhere he went. We remember we read in Acts that, that uh, he was in Jerusalem and there was trouble, and then the Christians sent him away. And after they sent him away, they said, and then there was a time of peace. He was whipped, stoned, in prison, run out of town. He was relentless, starting churches everywhere he went and leading Jews and Greeks and Romans to obey Christ. Here's a question. This is a rhetorical question. You don't need to raise your hand, but I want you to ask it to yourself. Do you think you would like the Apostle Paul? Don't answer it. If Paul came to your family, or if he met you on the street, or you, he worked with you for a few days, maybe working on tents or something, which would be pretty intense. Do you think you would like the Apostle Paul? Would you want him to come to our church, our homes? What would he have to say about Foundation Bible Church? Do we, here's another question, do we even believe Paul? Do we believe his words? When he says something like, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's in 2 Timothy. Do we believe that? Or you think, no, I'm, I'm living this amazingly godly life and I've never faced persecution. Nobody's ever disliked me or not wanted to talk to me. Well, guys, hey, do you believe Paul? Everybody who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Yeah, right, Paul. Or how about, dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite, meaning the things they want in life. They brag about shameful things. And they think, only about life here on earth. Philippians chapter 3. These are hard words. Would we want Paul in our church? Would we want him to, in our home? These are words Paul gave us while inspired by the Holy Spirit. I call them Paul's words. They're God's words. Theologian N.T. Wright, don't agree with everything that he says, but he's, he'll make you think. He describes Paul in this way. There is a reason why Saul of Tarsus, by the way, Tarsus was a, a Roman city founded in, in Greece. So I always thought Paul was, was more influenced by Greece, but he, he's probably a, a Roman culture, but also speaking Latin and Greece. In his early days in uh, there's a reason why Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus in his early days in Damascus is the one getting into trouble. Just is there a reason why the Jerusalem apostles then decided to pack him off home to Tarsus? He confronts Peter in Antioch. I've suggested that the only reason he doesn't say more at the Jerusalem conference is because Barnabas would have persuaded him to hold back. He is the kind of man you want on your side in the debate. <coughs> Remember we talked about how Christians say, don't debate people. And Paul says, I confronted them, I debated them, I argued with them. <coughs> but... Who, but he's the kind of man who you want on your side in a debate, but who just might alienate more sensitive souls. 
he confronts the magistrates in Philippi. He was itching to speak to the vast crowd in Ephesus. Remember last week we were talking about this huge riot in, in the city of Ephesus, two weeks ago in the city of Ephesus. There was an amphitheater. Uh, some scholars say it fits 25,000. Some say 50,000. I think it depends on the size of the butt. So they were in this huge amphitheater, and they're shouting back and forth, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. If this was in America, they would be saying, uh, uh, Ephesians, Artemis, Ephesians, Artemis, or, or we love Artemis. Yes, we do. We love Artemis. How about you? And they don't do that. We don't. Yeah. That was demonic. And, and, and they would shout back saying that they, they love him too. And, and Paul says, let me in there. I want to talk to these folks. His friends have to hold him back. And some, some of the leaders in the city who probably had become Christians were saying, Paul, do not go in there. And they, they kept him out, amazingly. But Paul sees this huge crowd, and he must have thought, maybe God brought all these people together so I can preach to twenty five or 50,000 people all at one time. And remember what they were accusing him of. They said, our business, we're, we're making these little idols as souvenirs because the whole world is coming to Ephesus. The business is going down because everybody, not only in the city of Ephesus, which was the second largest city in the Roman Empire, about 250,000 people, uh, people from all over the known world, even as far as India, would come to, to the to Temple of Artemis, which is like one of the seven wonders of the world, and they'd buy these little souvenir statues to take home. And they're saying, not only is he leading everybody in the city, but everybody in all the country, countryside is starting to listen to Paul, and our bottom line is, is falling down. Our dollars are shrinking. And so they all get together. They, 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 they riot, and Paul says, let me in there. I want to talk to these folks. Uh, so he was itching to speak to a vast crowd in Ephesus. N.T. Wright goes on. He tries to explain himself to the Jerusalem mob that had been trying to lynch him. He rebukes the high priest. Now he does repent of that. Uh, he knows how to turn the factions of the Sanhedrin against one another, he lectured the Roman governor himself about justice, self-control, and the coming judgment. Who was on trial? Paul put the Roman, uh, the, the Roman uh, leader on trial. He tells the ship owner, this is really weird. We're going to get to it in Acts. The guy who owned the ship and the ship's captain, he tells them where they should and should not spend the winter, where they should harbor their boat. And then says, I told you so when it all goes horribly wrong. He spots the sailors who were trying to bolt and tells the centurion to stop them, which made him popular with the sailors. As a companion, he must have been exhilarating when things were going well and exasperating when they weren't. Uh, in a different place, he called Paul a high maintenance, high rewards friend. As an opponent, he would cause some people to contemplate murder as their only recourse. Wright goes on to say, though that despite Paul's relentless and your-face energy, people loved him, wanted to work with him, and wept when he left. With Paul, what you see is what you get, even if it isn't what you wanted. Life would not have been dull when he was around, but it would not have been particularly relaxing either. But they would have acknowledged that when they were with him, they saw truth more clearly. He was the sort of person through whom other people were changed. Changed so that they themselves would take forward the same work with the same amount of energy as they can muster. If loyalty to the one God and his Messiah was Paul's watchword, one of the reasons why the strange movement he had started thrived in the coming days was because his associates were, for the most part, fiercely loyal to Paul himself. And you can see that in Luke's writing. He loved them. And they loved him. That's how things got done. That's how movements succeed. True. And yet, maybe some of you are thinking this. And yet, they, his friends were loyal to them. And yet, some of Paul's very last words we have recorded. Isn't that interesting? His, his last letter to the young, uh, uh, the young uh, pastor, Timothy, probably his last letter, at least the last one that we have, so we get to see what's on his heart as he's facing death. What's on his heart near the end of his life. Uh, he wrote to Timothy while in jail in Rome. As I read, think about how you would have felt in Paul's position if you were in jail because you're trying to help people find Jesus. And also, I want you to think, as I'm reading this, does this sound like a made-up religion to you? That somebody wrote, sat down and wrote a novel and this is what they put down? 
Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 9-16. He's writing to Timothy, Do your best to come to me quickly, Timothy. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Here's his last words. Demas, my friend, my brother, he loved this world too much. He left. He deserted me. Christians has gone to Galatia and Titus has gone to Demetia. Only Luke is with me. That sounds lonely, doesn't it? Only Luke is with me. He says, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. That's the same Mark that he didn't want to spend time with before because Mark had run home. He was probably a rich boy. He ran home to mommy when the going got rough. Barnabas then wanted to bring Mark on their next missionary trip. Paul says, I'm not taking him. You can't rely on that man. So Barnabas and and, uh, uh, Mark go off. They start their own uh, thing. Uh, Paul goes off with Silas, start their own missionary work. But now we see at the end of his life, Mark has proven himself to Paul. Paul says, bring Mark to me. I can use that man. He's, he's, He's helpful in my ministry. He says, I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. That's where he just came from, but this is years later. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me and not be held against them. We talked about this in Sunday school class again. Some folks are loyal, some folks ain't. Some folks stay, some folks run. Let's turn to Acts chapter 20. I remember one of the very first conferences I went to with the Great Commission, Rick Whitney was speaking. He says, I know a lot of you brothers in your churches. Pastor Rick has come here and spoke before. You probably remember him. Uh, He says, I know that people have left you, and it's hurt. And you've probably been asking yourself, what did I do? What did I do? What's wrong with me? He says, there's some good in that because you you need to reflect and think how you could have done things better. He says, at the end of the day, brothers, I just want you to know Some men are loyal, some men are not, and it's not always your fault. I think I cried. So uh, Acts chapter 20, let's look at 1 and 2. When the uproar had ended, this is the uproar in Ephesus, right, with this huge riot, this huge mob, uh, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. That's where Alexander the Great was from. He traveled through the area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where they stayed three months, because some of the Jews plotted against him, just as, uh, I'm going too far. So, Paul speaking many words doesn't surprise anybody. That was kind of his thing. When he started talking, he'd go on and on and on. Next week, we're going to see where he almost bored somebody to death, literally, uh, put somebody to sleep anyway. And... uh, Paul is is traveling through here. He's telling people many words of encouragement, like, you got this, babe. You're looking fantastic. Love the way you do your hair. No. Many of your translations probably use the word exhorted, the people with many words. Again, two things. Paul speaking many words is common. We see that again and again. Luke says many words. I wonder if it was an inside joke. Luke was saying, and he talked a lot. Again and again, Luke's telling us, and Paul talked a lot. Uh, everywhere Paul went, he was talking a lot about Jesus Christ. The second thing is the NIV uses the word encouraged instead of exhorted. Uh, This does not mean Paul was telling them that he really loved their fashion sense, that, you know, you are just really special and unique, just like everybody else. That's not what Paul said at all. Uh, He was exhorting them, he was encouraging them to obey God. He was encouraging them to remain loyal to Christ. He was encouraging them to live out their faith in difficult times, even when persecution comes hammering down on them and they feel like, I want to give up. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to leave. Why should I live for Christ when it's difficult in my life? He was encouraging them to to be strong and to keep going. 
This had nothing to do with silly self-esteem building. This had to say, stand firm. Let's look at Acts, uh, or, uh, Acts 20 through, uh, 2 through 6 now. This will be all we're going to read today, actually. Uh, he traveled through the area, uh, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because some Jews had plotted against him just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. So he's trying to avoid them and plus uh, go back through some areas he may have been through before. He was accompanied by Sopatar, son of Pyrrhus from Berea. Remember the Bereans? Aristarchus and Secondus from Thessalonica. We know that church, First and Second Thessalonians, right? Uh, Gaius from Derbe. Uh, Timothy also, we know his letters to the young pastor Timothy, and also Tychicus or Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia, meaning uh, Western, uh, Western Turkey. We would call it modern Turkey as the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troy. So when it says us, that means who is with him? Luke is with Paul. Uh, but we sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread, or Passover, and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Okay, here we get a look at some of Paul's friends. Uh, Paul was not in this alone. He had people who traveled with him. He had people that were uh, sharing these difficult times with him. We're going to look at some of their names right here. Sopatar, son of Pyrrhus from Berea. He's probably mentioned twice in Scripture. In Romans, Paul calls him a fellow countryman. So he was probably uh, Jewish and maybe even a, a relative. Uh, he was written about in Acts 17.11. Now the Bere- well, in, in, in Acts 17.11, it said, Now the Berean Jews were of a more noble character than those in Thessalonica. So they went to Thessalonica, and the, Christ- uh, the Jewish people there didn't listen so well. He goes to the city of Berea, and the Berean Jews were of a more noble character meaning the Thessalonians were of a less noble character uh, than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness, and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. All right, the next two fellows, Aristarchus and Secondus, are embarrassingly from Thessalonica. So according to scripture, they are less noble. I actually don't know if that's a proper way to read scripture. Probably not. Uh, so not talking about those two fellas, they weren't less noble, it's just the Thessalonians that they came from. In chapter 19, we saw that a huge mob had grabbed Aristarchus and Paul's other friend Gaius, uh, who was listed here, so we know he was willing to risk his life. Uh, Aristarchus was willing to risk his life for the gospel. In Colossians 4.10, Paul writes, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. This letter was probably written while Paul was in jail, and Aristarchus is right there with him in jail. At the end of his letter to Philemon, Paul writes, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends his greeting to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow uh, workers. Look at the big names. Aristarchus is listed with Mark and Luke, men who wrote down two of the four Gospels. But did you catch the other name there? Demas. He's the fellow that we heard earlier That Paul said in his very last letter, Demas has left me because he loved the world. Aristarchus, Epaphras, Mark, Luke, their names are forever in Scripture because they stayed the course. They they followed the Lord to the end. Now guess what? They're dead. Guess what about Demas? He's dead. Either way, you die. They lived their lives for Christ. Demas was suffering with Paul here in Philemon, but at the end, when he's in Rome, he takes off because he loved the world more than he loved the things of God. Isn't that sad? That now his name is immortalized in Scripture as the one who ran. The next fella, Secondus, we don't know much about Secondus. It's the only place in Scripture he's met written, uh, written about. But his name is interesting. It literally means number two. And some people have suggested that maybe he was a slave. Like this is slave number one, this is slave number two, this is slave number three. So, so here, Mr. No, Mr. Two is listed with these other great men of God. Aristarchus, Luke, Paul, number Mr. Two. And, and it's kind of just God. 
says he's right there in the mix of the rest of them. This <coughs> probably a former slaver. He could have been a slave of one of these men. <coughs> There's another possibility, though, and it's also equally cool. I didn't know this till yesterday. I knew the thing about second just might have been number two, known that for years. But there's, a, there's another thing that's interesting. I didn't know, but that was a nickname in, in Greek culture. Secondus was a way of calling a guy lucky. Hey, lucky. Which is so neat to think of Luke listing all the names of these guys and saying, and lucky was with us too. I don't know why they'd call anybody who traveled with them lucky. <laughs> Their lives were, it seemed to be anything but lucky. They had a rough go of it. But it's neat to think of these buddies walk into the next town. They're going to serve Jesus together. And, and Aristarchus was there, and Paul was there, and Luke was there, and Lucky was with us. Uh, the next fellow's name, name is Gaius. He was grabbed along with Aristarchus by the mob in Ephesus. So here's another guy who risked his life for the gospel, and he's still with Paul. He's still risking his life. This is a true brother, somebody who stands with you uh, through the hard times, even the death the deathly hard times. He was one of the two men that Paul baptized in Corinth. Remember Paul said, I'm glad I didn't baptize a bunch of you. Oh yeah, I, I baptized a couple of you. One of the guys he baptized there was, was Gaius. Uh, the apostle John wrote to Gaius a personal letter. Gaius was a rich man. He had a church in his home. He was, he was spending his money to help support other pastors and missionaries. And yet he's on the road walking and suffering with Paul. Isn't that beautiful? He didn't just let his money do his talking. Well, I wrote a check, so that should be enough. He was out there suffering with the other Christians. And, and John, right, the third John, written to Gaius. John writes him a personal letter, and we still have it these 2,000 years later. In, in, in it, uh, Gaius calls, uh, uh, or John calls Gaius a pastor. So he, he, I don't know if he was a pastor at this point, but he, comes a, he becomes a pastor. Not a big surprise that people hanging around with uh, uh, hanging around Paul, become pastors. And he wrote, To my dear friend Gaius, whom I truly love, dear friend, listen to this, I love this, you should only pray about spiritual things. Don't worry about small things like people's health. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you. Why wouldn't you pray for that for somebody you love? So he's hope, so jo, uh, the, the, the great uh, Apostle uh, John writes to Gaius, he calls him pastor, and, and, uh, and then he says, I pray that you're enjoying good health and that everything is going well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. John then ends the letter by saying, I have much to write you, but I don't want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon so we can talk face to face. So this man was a friend of Paul, and he's a friend of John, Gaius. By the way, if you'd never thought about him before this morning, look forward to spending time with him in heaven in, in eternity. These are our brothers. These, these are men that we're going to know for eternity. His next uh, friend, a young friend mentioned, is Timothy. And now Timothy is either a pastor or he's later going to become one. Again, not a surprise that people hang around with Paul become pastors. We've got two letters in our New Testament that Paul wrote uh, to him and encouraged him to be bold in his faith. So we've got guys who are traveling who are going to write books in the New Testament. Luke, uh, uh, Paul, uh, Mark. Uh, uh, and then we have guys who have letters written to them, Gaius and Timothy. Man, what a group. This is a group. This, is a, a, er, this group shook the world, shook the Roman Empire, and turned the world upside down. What a group of people we have here. So we have two uh, letters written to Timothy in our New Testament. Paul wrote to him and encouraged him, not saying, you are just really cool, my friend. Everything. No, he encouraged him to be bold in his faith. The next name maybe is unfamiliar to you, Tychicus. Unlike Luke and Timothy, no one today is naming their kids Tychicus. I don't know any little tykes. Well, maybe. Uh, but he's mentioned multiple times in Paul's letter. In, in, he's mentioned multiple times by Paul in different letters. He's, he's written in such a way that some Bible scholars think he may have been Paul's closest friend. Isn't that funny? Because you would have thought first Barnabas, maybe Silas, probably Luke. But the way he talks about him again and again, call him dear friend and trusting him with important missions, 
Tychicus, this guy we don't even think of, may have been one of Paul's closest confidants. Paul trusted him with personal messages. He sent them to Ephesus, and he said, talk to Tychicus. He'll fill you in on everything I didn't write about. And then he sends him to Colossian church. He says the same thing. Talk to him. He'll fill you in on everything that's going on in my life. Trophimus may have been a new believer because... Here it says that he's from the province of Asia, modern-day Turkey, but in the next chapter, we can, we're going we're gonna to learn that he's a Gentile from Ephesus. So they're just leaving Ephesus, maybe Trophimus. But, it, but Paul had been there twice. This is his third missionary journey. He had been there for a short time in his second missionary journey, so he could have become a believer then. I don't know. But he was, he was there for quite a, uh, quite a long time in Ephesus, so it's very possible he had become a believer there, and now he's traveling with Paul. There's also something neat, neat about Trophimus. In 2 Timothy 4.20, Paul says he had to leave him in Miletus because he was too sick to travel. This is the same Paul that the handkerchiefs that touched his body could heal people. And now he's got a good friend, and Paul says we had to leave him behind because he was too sick to travel. Do you think Paul prayed for him? I'm sure he did. God doesn't always do things the way we want him to. Paul prayed for Trophimus, I'm sure he did, and uh, they had to leave him behind at at Miletus. Uh, (coughs) There's another thing that's interesting about this, and I don't know. I think it's probably true, just because of church tradition. But uh, him going to Miletus and leaving Trophimus there doesn't fit with any of uh, Paul's journeys recorded in the book of Acts. We can't see where he could have possibly gone there. Uh, So this is one of the reasons why people think that Paul goes to Rome, is released from prison, and has about a year's time where he ministers to the Greek side of the Roman Empire, the eastern half, goes to the western half. There's evidence that he went to Spain, shared the gospel there. There's even evidence, if you want to believe the Scots, I don't know, the Scots say, they claim, it's even in their constitution, that Paul went to Scotland and preached the gospel. I do have this to say, He wrote some very intellectual letters to those on the Greek side. He didn't write any intellectual letters that we still have to the Scots. Just saying. (laughs) Leave that for what it's worth. Uh, But then he ends up back in Rome again, and he is killed. Uh, Church history tells us he's killed uh, for his faith uh, in in Rome. Uh, He's arrested again, tried again, executed uh, by Nero. So that's speculation, but it is based on some evidence from Scripture like this, like how could it fit in only if he had another missionary journey, a fourth missionary journey, Uh, and then also uh, from church tradition, church history. Uh, Look at verse 6 again. Can everybody turn there? We're almost done. Uh, Chapter 20, verse 6. But we, remember that means Luke is with them, but we sailed from Philippi. After the festival of unleavened bread, and five days later, we joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Uh, Interesting to think of Paul and his friends, including at least Trophimus, at least one Gentile, celebrating the feast of unleavened bread or or Passover together. Uh, Passover comes all the way back from the time when the the nation of Israel, when, when the Jews were still in captivity in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. And God was going to bring them out of the land, and he was bringing a curse against the land of Egypt. He was going to kill every firstborn. And he said, take a lamb, kill the lamb, and paint its blood on the doorposts. Then when my wrath passes over, if I see the blood, my wrath will pass over that home. I wonder if Paul talk to them as they celebrate Passover together, if he talked about Jesus Christ. Jesus is our lamb of God who was slain for our sins. He is our Passover lamb. And the Bible says the wrath of God is coming on all unrighteousness. God will judge. Hell is a real place. And if we don't get right with God, we're going to be eternal, eternally separated from everything good. But the Bible tells us that when, God, when God's wrath comes, if the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to our lives, his wrath will pass over. So how do you get the blood of Jesus Christ? How do you get, the, how do you get saved? How can, you, how can you get right with God? Here's what you do. You say, dear Lord God, I want to be a part of, I want to be on your side. And he will not turn anybody away. Lord God, I see I'm a sinner. 
Thank you that Jesus died for my nastiness, my hard-headedness, my self-righteousness, all these bad things in my soul. Thank you for loving me enough for dying for me. I want to follow you. I want to, I, I want to be part of your plan. And then the Bible says he forgives us of all our sins. He's faithful to forgive us of all of our sins. And the blood of Christ pays for our sins. Brothers and sisters, if you haven't done that yet, make sure you get it done. Uh, I hate to use articles in the news because these are loved ones people care about, but in the newspaper every day, somebody dies unexpectedly. Brothers and sisters, get right with the Lord. Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you. He cares about you. Heaven's doors are wide open. The blood of Jesus Christ is here for everyone who will turn and accept. Do that. Pray to God. Talk to him about that. Get right with Jesus. And then talk to somebody in the church about it. And uh, we'll get you baptized. Uh, we'll get you on the right path. Uh, Jesus says we should learn to be disciples, fully committed to following him in every way. Uh, make sure you get that done. Uh, Jesus is, is knocking. And just open up your heart and uh, start to do life with him. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, our dear brother Paul had a rough go of it. And it can even be depressing sometimes to think, look back and think about the things that he went through because he loved you and loved other people. But Lord God, we're thankful that you didn't leave him alone. You left him with Luke and Timothy and Mark, a bunch of other friends, Lord. That these bold band of brothers who wrote so, many, so much of our New Testament, Lord, uh, traveled together, walked together, slept by the side of the road together, ate together, shared the message of Jesus Christ together, shared in suffering, Lord. They shared their lives together as they did everything they could to win as many as they could to faith in, their, in your son, Jesus Christ. Dear Lord God, we have hard times too. Please help us. Please help us, Lord. We can be sad and lonely and depressed and we can face uh, poverty and physical ailments. Lord God, help us to be loyal friends to one another, to stand with one another, to go through these hard times together, Lord. And Father, help us too to live our lives every day on mission, eager to share the cross of Jesus Christ, our testimony, an invitation to Bible study, invitation to church with everybody we can. Please help us, Lord. Strengthen us. Empower us. Encourage us. And then help us to be encouragements to one another. Lord God, thank you for Paul and his friends and their witness. We pray this in your name. Amen.